In our continuing series, Equipping Skeptics to Recognize the Fallacies Some Apologists Use to Support Their Belief that the Bible is True, we next examine Bob Duco, radio Christian talk show host and apologist, who digs into the book of Isaiah to assert, Isaiah 9, 1 and 2 prophesies that the Messiah will minister in Galilee. And of course, we read in Matthew 4 that he does minister in Galilee. When dealing with all so-called prophecies promoted by apologists and evangelicals, whether they are supposed to apply to some event or person from the past, like Jesus, or to some contemporary or near-future person or event, like the formation of Israel in 1948 or World War III, it's always important to situate the verses the apologist uses in their original contexts. The current assertion that Isaiah 9, 1 and 2 somehow figures into the life of Christ as reflected in the Gospel of Matthew is just another case of exercising this exact caution. Now, while Duco does not specify which verses of Matthew 4 reflect the so-called prophecy of Isaiah, fellow evangelical pastor John Hagee details in his book, Can America Survive? Ten Prophetic Signs That We Are the Terminal Generation, the prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled when Jesus ministered in Capernaum. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But what specifically did the prophet Isaiah say regarding Galilee in his book, and how was it in reference to the future Messiah, and particularly to Jesus? From the verses as quoted in Matthew, it sounds like the people of Capernaum and those of the Galilee had been living in darkness, which was dispelled by the coming of Jesus. However, the section of Isaiah from which these verses are taken was dealing with current events, not looking forward to the first century CE. Isaiah was written around the time of the Syrian Ephraim crisis in the mid to late 700s BCE, when Syria and Ephraim, otherwise known as the Northern Kingdom of Israel, were aligned against the forces of Assyria and were pressuring the southern kingdom of Judah, ruled by King Ahaz in Jerusalem, to join their alliance. Ahaz had refused. The passage here from Isaiah, however, has given rise to a variety of interpretations, all, however, within this larger historical context, taking place some 700 years before the ministry of Jesus. A look at the verses in their native context quickly reveals they had nothing whatsoever to do with a prediction regarding someone in the future beginning a ministry in Galilee, much less that the Messiah would do so, and even less that this would apply to Jesus specifically. The so-called prophecy as quoted in Matthew isn't even the entirety of Isaiah 9 verses 1 and 2. They in fact together read, But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. To what does this gloom and contempt of the land of Zebulun and Naphtali refer? Who is the he who brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and Naphtali? And who will, in the latter time, make glorious the way of the sea, Galilee of the nations? What is the way of the sea? What is meant by Galilee of the nations? How is any of this relevant to Jesus of Nazareth, the supposed future Messiah? Where in the verse is there any reference at all to the Messiah, much less of him ministering in Galilee? Again, as with most proof texts taken from the Hebrew Scriptures and applying to Jesus, it is easiest to understand these verses from Isaiah in their larger context. The passage from which these two verses are lifted is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. But there will be no gloom for those who are in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. 
The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders and the rod of their oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness for this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Noted code words like Prince of Peace certainly make this passage sound like it could be in reference to Jesus Christ. But of course, such code words have been used by the proponents of Christianity since its inception. This passage from Isaiah, removed from Christian interpreters and apologists, reads much differently in its native context. But as noted, modern scholars differ on exactly how to interpret these verses, uncertain exactly who the main characters are supposed to be in the text, given that they are not named. However, the general consensus on the interpretation of the text is exampled by Walter Brueggemann in his book on Isaiah. In the context of chapters 6 through 8, the former time is apparently the time of failure and oppression under the rule of Ahaz. The latter time apparently is the time after Ahaz when new royal leadership makes new peace and prosperity possible. The oracle apparently concerned the joyous announcement of the birth of a new Davidic king who would have the authority, resolve, and capacity to reverse the fortunes of Judah. Because Ahaz in this part of the book of Isaiah is the embodiment of failed leadership, his son Hezekiah is reckoned to be the celebrated subject of this oracle. Verses 2 and 3 announce the spectacular newness that will be visible in the socio-political horizon of Judah. The darkness refers to a situation of despair and oppression at the hand of Assyria. The transformation to be wrought is a vigorous military one. The yoke and rod bespeak oppression, perhaps in the form of heavy imposed imperial taxes by the Assyrians. The expected and welcome defeat is not a spiritual or religious or nice one. It is brutal military activity whereby the equipment of the enemy soldiers, all bloodied in the much killing, is burned as an act not only of elimination of weapons, but also of gloating and of consequent humiliation of the enemy. Similarly, biblical scholar William M. Schneidwin, chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Culture, the Kirschwin Chair of Ancient Eastern Mediterranean Studies, and Professor of Biblical Studies in Northwest Semitic Languages at UCLA, discusses these verses in clear summary. The book of Isaiah itself places this prophecy between 730 and 715 BCE, just a few years after the fall of Galilee to Tiglath-Pileser III and perhaps several years after the final defeat of the north. In 722, Hezekiah was faced with a flood of immigrants from the defeated northern kingdom. Rather than barricading his borders, Hezekiah tried to integrate these refugees into his realm, hoping thereby to restore Israel's idealized golden age, the kingdom of David and Solomon. Thus, the famous messianic prophecies of Isaiah of Jerusalem must have been understood by the citizens of Jerusalem as commentary and political policy. The prophecy offered hope to those people who walked in darkness. That is, it extended the Davidic promise to the northern kingdom. Israelites walked in darkness, not only because of the gloom and despair ravished upon them by the rod of the oppressor, but also because they had rejected the rightful king of the united north and south, the son of David. Who was this child that was born? Who was this son given to us? An earlier prophecy had already spoken of this Davidic son, in Isaiah 7:14, in the days of Ahaz, king of Judah, God gave a sign to the house of David. Look, the young maiden is with child and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. The Hebrew literally, God is with us. To Isaiah's audience, this child could be none other than Hezekiah. Nostalgically, the people of Jerusalem looked to Hezekiah, the son of David, to restore the golden age of peace and prosperity. 
Regardless of who scholars believe the text is in reference to, when it mentions he who brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephtali from the former time, and he who will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations in the latter time, or even the name of the child who was born as Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, it is clear from the context of Isaiah that this passage was in no sense a reference to Jesus' ministry beginning in Galilee, regardless of Matthew's hijacking and misapplication of it for Christian propagandic purposes. Funding for this program was provided in part by the generous contributions of viewers like you via Patreon. Consider joining them at www.patreon.com forward slash Bible Skeptic. Thank you.